Hello and welcome to Addressing Diversity in Mental Health Care. I'm your moderator, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, founder of the Kennedy Forum, an organization that unites mental health advocates, business leaders, and government agencies around a common set of principles, including full implementation of the federal parity law I was honored to author when I was in Congress. I'm honored to host today's virtual panel to discuss the programs, initiatives, and organizations that are making a difference when it comes to connecting diverse populations with critical mental health tools and resources. The events of 2020 have really revealed some glaring inequities in terms of our access. Today, we're going to explore that and more with four inspirational leaders. Cynthia Germanata is president and co-founder of Born This Way Foundation. Amit Paley is CEO and executive director of the Trevor Foundation. Anel Prem is senior medical director of the um, Steve Fund. Thanks to everyone for being part of this. The first question is, as leaders of different organizations, we're each seeing the mental health impact of this pandemic and racial injustice through unique lenses. Cynthia, can you tell us a little bit more about Born This Way Foundation and share some of your insights that you've gained from the trends you've observed? Absolutely. And Patrick, thank you for having me and for shining the light on this important topic. Um, I co-founded Born This Way Foundation with my daughter, Stephanie, who many of you may know as Lady Gaga. And the reason was to fulfill her passion and her desire for a world that's kinder and braver and one where young people are better equipped to deal with their mental health issues than she felt that she was when she first began experiencing them in high school. So we work very hard every day on three lofty goals, making kindness cool, validating the emotions of young people everywhere, and eliminating the stigma around mental health. And in addition to research, we do this by modeling healthy conversations connecting young people with resources and services, uh, both online and offline, and also building communities that really understand and foster good mental health. Um, I have to say, we have over the past years, despite the enormous challenges that we're facing, we've seen a growing trend of young people that are being more willing to talk about their mental health. And they're fo you know, we have been 100% focused on fostering those conversations. We see young people that want to help and they want to be helped, yet there are still barriers and gaps that I think we as the mental health community, we really need to fill. Um, I most recently spoke with an amazing young panel of inspiring young people from very diverse backgrounds. Cheyenne serves as global ambassador for the Native American youth, uses her platform to talk about mental health. Hannah and Charlie, uh, created the Not Okay app, which is a digital panic button. When you are in help, it reaches out to your closest friends and advisors. And these are just a few examples of the very diverse community of young people um, that we work with every day. Now, that said, um, there's still barriers. Uh, the good news, nine out of 10 people from our research, young people, prioritize their mental health. The issue is they don't know where to go. Uh, they also, they face significant barriers, uh, of course, we all know to getting affordable, reliable uh, cost of quality mental health care. Uh, but in particular, they just don't know where to go. And this is continuing to lead to the increasing rates of depression and suicide and anxiety disorders, many of which were highlighted recently in two important studies, one by the CDC, where young and one in four young adults had contemplated suicide over a 30 day period in June, which is just astounding and unacceptable. And from the Chegg organization, more than half of all students said that they were extremely worried about their mental health, more than half offered support to a friend or had a friend reach, reach out to them. Um, I think to just lower these statistics is not acceptable. I think we need to all work together and smarter uh, to eliminate them. So we're carefully curating conversations and we have a number of initiatives underway uh, that I look forward to, to talking to you about. Thank you so much, Cynthia. What a terrific uh, explanation of the many things that you're involved with, as well as giving us some 
excellent examples of what the latest data shows. Um, is there any chance, Amit, you can uh, add a little bit of the perspective that you're seeing? Obviously, I'm sure it dovetails with a lot of what already has been said by Cynthia, but I also know from having seen you on many of these uh, conferences that uh, you're working very hard and helping to address a very underrepresented community with very high risks uh, when it comes to mental health. Yes, ha happy to do so. And I'll first just say it, it's really an honor to be with such inspiring leaders uh, working to address uh, inequities in, in mental health. Um, and we, we do work with all of you and all of your organizations, so it's great to be in community with you all. At, at the Trevor Project, we are the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for LGBTQ young people. And Patrick, as you alluded, LGBTQ young people are at particular risk for a, a whole host of different negative mental health outcomes. Uh, it, the Trevor Project puts out a national survey and our most recent results showed that 40% of LGBTQ young people seriously considered suicide in the past year, and more than half of transgender and non-binary young people considered suicide in the past year. So um, LGBTQ young people face particular risks on top of the risks that young people facing in general, as Cynthia, as Cynthia so eloquently just shared. And then on top of the, the risks that LGBTQ young people face in general, this year has exacerbated a lot of those uh, issues. Uh, so many LGBTQ young people because of COVID are now trapped in, fam in, in homes with families that are unsupportive and unaffirming. Many of them don't have resources and don't, are not able to express themselves. Um, we just put out a, a survey actually in the past week with Morning Consult, uh, a nationwide survey that showed that 40% of LGBTQ young people said that they were unable to express their LGBTQ identity um, because of COVID and 56% of transgender and non-binary young people said that. Um, in particular, trans and non-binary young people said that they felt unsafe in their homes and unable to be respected in terms of their names, the way that they're expressing the gender and their pronouns. Uh, of course, we have other crises beyond just COVID-19 this year as the country grapples with um, a long overdue reckoning on racial violence, systemic racism, uh, that has also impacted young people. That The survey that I just shared with you uh, found that a majority of young people, including 73% of LGBTQ young people, have had the, the news reports and images of violence against Black people, that that has had a negative impact on their well-being. Um, and in particular, Black LGBTQ youth have been particularly impacted at the intersection of all these forms of discrimination uh, and lack of support. Uh, and, and an even higher numbers of black LGBTQ young people said that, that they, their negative, their mental well-being was being negatively impacted. And so I think all of this just goes to show that we really need to focus on the multiple identities that people are holding and the people who hold minority identities, especially those who hold multiple minority identities um, need to be a source of focus to make sure that we can have equity and support for all people in this country, and especially in terms of, of their mental health and well-being. So Amit, um, if I want to be sensitive um, and we want to make sure people don't feel singled out, how do I um, identify the pronoun for me if I am filling out a signature is it Patrick Kennedy, him? How, how does that work so that we can educate folks who might be watching about how that works as a way of de um, kind of stigmatizing those that may feel um, that they have a separate identity um, through the use of a pronoun? I really appreciate you asking that, Patrick. And, and it is exactly that. Um, at, in a lot of the meetings that we have at the Trevor Project, when we first start, we introduce ourselves and then say our pronouns. So I would say, my name is Amit Paley. My pronouns are he, him. Um, someone who might use she, her pronouns might say, this is my name, I use she, her pronouns. We also have a number of young people that use they, them pronouns. Some people use multiple pronouns, he, she, or they interchangeably. And there are also a lot of, of neo pronouns that people use as well. And I, I'm really glad you asked about this because I think for some people, this is new. And for some people who are not used to talking about pronouns, they might wonder, 
does this really matter? Why is this important? And the answer is this matters profoundly because for, for people who um, do not have their gender identity uh, supported, do not have people respect their gender identity, that puts them at much higher risk of suicide. And, and the national survey I mentioned that, that we did at the Trevor Project, it actually found that the degree to which your pronouns are respected directly correlates with the degree to which you have considered suicide. So by respecting people's pronouns and also by sharing your own pronouns to make, pronouns to make it comfortable for other people to do that, you can really play a serious and important part in reducing the risk of suicide and you can play an important part in saving lives of LGBTQ young people. Awesome, thank you so much, Amit. And Dr. Prem, can you give us your perspective? Absolutely, and uh, my pleasure to be a part of this esteemed panel. Uh, the Steve Fund, uh, for which I serve as Senior Medical Director, is the nation's leading organization focused on the mental health and emotional well-being of young people of color, from adolescence to emerging adulthood, in the transitions from high school to college and into the workplace. Uh, our surveys have shown that young people of color report higher levels of isolation and lower levels of inclusiveness in their white peers, and often this can trigger depression and anxiety, um, yet they are less likely to seek help, which can threaten their academic as well as their occupational outcomes. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, um, the, the, the pandemic has really added on to some of the pre-existing disparities uh, that we see in young people of color. First of all, it has disproportionately uh, uh, wrought higher infection and death rates among communities of color, and this generated considerable trauma and loss uh, within our demographic. The economic crisis has wrought additional devastation and demoralization with high unemployment rates, housing and food insecurity, and students of color are more likely than their white counterparts to have to lighten their course load and to be uncertain about continuing their college education in the midst of this. There's also an educational crisis which affects mental health as well with remote learning, difficulties in accessing laptops, Wi-Fi, and broadband in some areas. This has created additional stress. Students of color are experiencing higher rates of depression and anxiety than white students uh, according to some surveys. They're less likely to view their professors as sources of support during the pandemic. And Asian students uh, have been targeted. They've been more likely to experience discrimination than any other group. And we know the connection between discrimination and its negative impact on mental health. Uh, students of color also experience some uh, disproportionately low percentages of paid in internships, which can increase anxiety as one is transitioning from college into the workplace. And then for those workplace environments that have not taken the opportunity to create a culture of belonging, um, uh, which ha have not created a, a, an environment of belonging or a culture of belonging, this really adds risk uh, to the mental health uh, burden on young people of color that's brought up uh, brought about more so uh, by the pandemic and the racial injustice uh, as evidenced by the killing of uh, George Floyd and many other killings. These examples really illustrate some of the disparate mental health impacts of the pandemic and systemic injustice on the mental health of young people of color. Thank you so much, Dr. Prem. Would you also mention the need for employers to uh, put together sensitivity and uh, bias sensitivity training for their workplace, especially in the wake of uh, Black Lives Matter and the need for um, the majority community to really have a much better appreciation for um, the issues you've just raised. Yes, the workplace is a very important um, site uh, for attention to these issues. Um, there really needs to be uh, buy-in at the top and the willingness to speak very frankly and openly about racial issues and some of the re realities in our country. That helps to create um, an environment of transparency and trust. Uh, and also 
uh, for the leadership of, of a company or a workplace to uh, be open to hearing the voices of their workers of color. Um, some workplaces have uh, employee resource groups. These are often a helpful way of bringing up some of the issues that affect uh, people in that organization and really give license for people to talk about it, process it, and that helps uh, to keep these issues from being taboo where they can fester and cause more harm, trauma, uh, senses of, of being isolated and not belonging, which uh, as we know is not good for anyone's mental health. Thank you, Dr. Prim. I would imagine that um, you know, you, Amit, could, could mention similar initiatives, and I am familiar with the need for us to do that for our returning veterans. There is a lack of appreciation for some of the ex experiences that they have had and uh, ab amongst the general uh, civilian workforce. So this is an issue that employers need to embrace um, in, in a holistic way, just across the board, and frankly, have not invested as much in as that I hope will they'll begin to do. Um, Amit, maybe you could just talk a little bit about the guides and the resources uh, for those who are looking to learn more about um, these conversations. Absolutely. So I, I think for folks who are looking to learn more, first of all, folks who are learning to looking to learn more on how to support people who might be thinking about suicide. Um, September we just ended was National Suicide Prevention Month and the, the Trevor Project put out uh, a guide and we urge people to think of the acronym CARE. Uh, the C in CARE stands for connecting with a person, making sure you are taking the time to, to talk with them and reach out to people that might need support. The A is for ask, asking directly about suicide. A lot of people are sometimes afraid to ask if someone is thinking of killing themselves. And we want to encourage people not to be afraid of that question. That question can be life-saving. It can lead people to share something that they might not have shared before. The R in CARE stands for respond. We, we, we encourage people to respond with compassion and empathy, validating the emotions that people have, reflecting back what they're going through. Um, and then the E stands for empower. Empower the person you are talking to with information and support that might help them improve their situation that can be providing them uh, resources that they might reach out to. And in the case of LGBTQ youth, that might be an organization like the Trevor Project, which runs 24 seven phone, text and chat lifelines for young people to reach out to. Um, but that could be a host of other different resources. Uh, we've also created resources and guides um, for people looking to support LGBTQ youth during this time of COVID, which has been so stressful. And so we have a guide on our website for how to support LGBTQ young people dealing with anxiety and stress during this pandemic. And we've also created resources on how to support Black LGBTQ young people who are facing so much uh, stress uh, and difficulties with all the multiple forms of crises that are happening right now and how to approach those intersectional conversations. Uh, I also wanted, as, as we talk about the need for diversity and making, making sure that we are really focused that there are no one size fits all solutions and that individual people and different types of people need different types of support and care. We've put out a lot of research reports and briefs. Uh, as I mentioned, the national survey we just did uh, that came out, we've done research briefs on black LGBTQ youth, which actually came out today, um, as well as on Latinx health, on bisexual young people and a whole host of other identities. So for those looking for more information, you can find it on our website, thetrevorproject.org. So Cynthia, I think what the common theme here is that a lot of people have no idea, you know, they're all thumbs when it comes to trying to understand in a way that isn't offensive uh, to minorities, how to address these issues, how to understand them. And maybe you could kind of take us through how, especially with kids, giving them the tools to know how uh, to be kind, uh, to know how to talk to one another. I mean, everyone expects that we're given a handbook when we're born to know how to act our way through life. And many of us have to learn it through experience, but with resources like yours and, and the others that have been mentioned, I think we're recognizing 
that there are tools both for kids to learn about how to be kind, but also to learn about their own social, emotional, um, mental health and how they can do a better job at mediating and um, mitigating some of their um, feelings such that they're not feeling uh, really um, ruled by those feelings, but the ability to cope with them and do problem solving internally within their own lives. So maybe you could talk a little bit about those issues uh, as it relates well, to ab- Absolutely. And I know there are tools, uh, you know, Amit sm- spoke about some of them as well as Dr. Prim, that what they said really resonated with me. And um, we need to provide those tools to young people. That's that gap that I mentioned that we know from our research that young people, they just, they just don't know where to turn. Uh, we also know from our research, though, that young people who report being in kind environments uh, have higher mental health indicator scores. And that is true whether it's in schools, the workplace, at home, um, for many, and these environments have, they're blended. So um, for example, when uh, Dr. Prim was talking about um, in the workplace, we partnered with a, a chamber of commerce on something called the business of kindness. And we have learned that something as simple as, you know, in your, your diversity and inclusion program, saying hello to your employees by name and having affinity groups and resources for uh, minority employ- employees is so very, very important. And these are not, these are not cost, effect, uh, cost uh, prohibitive Uh, programs to implement. So there are things out there. Uh, We're focusing on kindness, uh, inclusion, connection uh, through partnering. And just last month, we wrapped up our Be Kind 21 initiative. Uh, It's a call to action for people around the world to engage in activities of kindness for 21 days. And, you know, the theory there is, is if you do something for 21 days, it can be become a habit, but primarily it's to be mindful of it. So we work with over 200 partners. In fact, um, Amit, we partnered with Trevor. Uh, we have also partner extensively with other LGBTQ organizations like Ali Forney Center. And we recruited over 112 million pledged acts of kindness. And, you know, there's a direct link between kindness and one's mental health. And um, it's v- been very, very effective now. And, you know, also kindness is not just being kind. It's, we had a campaign called Kindly Mask. It's registering to vote. It's advocating for a world where everyone is loved, included, and respected. So it's not just, you know, advocating and voting is also an act of of kindness. Uh, We also recently um, released a book called Channel Kindness that started as a digital platform that really shows the power of storytelling. We've encouraged young people since the beginning of our foundation to share their stories because it validates other stories. It helps them open up and share their own. And we, we just saw the tremendous power of this and we had to put it into words in a book. Uh, so we're encouraging young people all over the world now to share their stories and it's very, very empowering. Um, I could also point to resources for young people. Uh, we, we have a tool called bethere.org through a sh- partnership with uh, jack.org in Canada. Um, often when a young person's in crisis, they'd rather talk to a peer than an adult, but they don't really know how to help uh, their peer. So bethere.org helps with those tough conversations. It, it teaches you how to ask the right questions, get an adult involved, and um, helps break down that barrier. And uh, there's many, many other apps that we can give you to post uh, in the telehealth and online resource space, things that help to ease anxiety, apps like Calm, uh, Seven Cups. Uh, There's obvious 24-hour services, uh, 211, the Treasure Trevor Project, and many, many more. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I can tell you when we say that we're gratefully recovering, people, it means because we have a, finally, a toolkit to learn how to manage our stress and how to cope with uh, life's challenges in a way that we didn't have before. And um, 
this idea of serving others, I think, is really uh, elemental to helping uh, ourselves. It's the great paradox and irony that by uh, helping another, uh, it does so much for your own uh, sense of purpose and well-being. Um, it's a tenet of uh, all 12-step recovery, and I think it's founded on a Absolutely. lot of history that it really works. So thank you so much. I thought we'd just conclude today on a happier kind of thinking about the future and maybe um, how maybe telehealth, even though we know technology can be isolating for many people, um, telehealth might inc increase access in many respects to um, this peer connection. Because I know from my own experience, I can go on a um, Zoom 24-7 and talk to people from all over the world who are joining the same 12-step meeting as I am. Um, it, there is a value to that. I never was able to get that kind of uh, coverage. I certainly miss the in-person, I think, which is so critical, that chemistry. But talk a little bit about uh, the benefits and, and also something that you think that this current crisis is going to bring to our future in terms of hopefully a much more um, sensitive, uh, accepting world uh, because of the need of all peoples to begin to better uh, appreciate one another and uh, everyone's unique background as opposed to not thinking about their needs and their sensitivities. So um, I'd like to th think that we could start with Dr. Prim uh, and hope that this uh, age-old crisis of racism in our country and frankly, around the world is, is once again coming to a head really for a new generation who never appreciated um, the historical aspects of racism and what it means to, in, in President Kennedy's words, who uh, was the first president to address civil rights as a moral issue, um, to walk in someone else's shoes. Um, and who amongst us, as he said, would be content with those who counsel patience and delay if they were living under the oppressive uh, kind of very violent circumstances that so many people who are minorities in this country live with on a daily basis? Well, when we at the Steve Fund um, look at the future, um, we see telehealth as being a, a critical part of it. And while um, COVID-19 has been, you know, just a horrible crisis for our nation, um, some of the lemonade, if you want to call it that, has been uh, a surge of use of, of telehealth and making mental health services in particular uh, much more accessible to people who had all sorts of barriers before or may have felt uncomfortable walking into a building that said psychiatric center or a community mental health clinic. And so that's really put mental health uh, in people's hands right at their fingertips. Uh, and so that's, that's a really, uh, really good thing. And that's one of the many recommendations uh, in the Steve Funds Crisis Response Task Force uh, that was de developed by um, a group of cross-sectoral leaders um, from higher education, uh, mental health, professionals and those uh, from the uh, corporate and nonprofit sectors. Um, and, you know, that community, which in addition to being cross-sectoral was also uh, cross-racial and cross-cultural, um, is coming together uh, to establish a community of action, uh, which requires the um, active engagement of, of all stakeholders, of all of those backgrounds, uh, working together and developing cutting edge initiatives that uh, support mental health and well being of young people of color. This requires people to come out of the silos. We're often siloed and separate uh, in you know, where we're based and how we think. Uh, and that this means that um, both within and outside uh, institutions and organizations, they need to come together to address some of the social determinants of health, which often align um, with um, the experiences of people of color in terms of experience, some of the adverse uh, impacts of the social determinants of health, such as racial injustice, uh, and also to focus on some of those cultural considerations that 
relate to the realities of young people of color. I think creating environments where uh, trust is, is really put at the top, uh, where you're creating a welcoming and engaging environment so that people feel like they belong regardless of their racial background, their ability, et cetera. Um, this is you know, what's going to need to happen. And I think that given some of the continued disproportionate economic impacts of the pandemic on young people of color, that organizations like the Steve Fund and, and those of my colleagues on this panel um, are ready to lead by forming, forging innovative solutions uh, to support the mental health well-being uh, of uh, young people uh, across the board, measure the impact, disseminate the findings, and, and continuously improve. I think that's what it's going to take um, to, um, you know, move those levers and, and make the kind of change uh, that we want to see in terms of equality and equity. Beautifully said. I, um, just to conclude today, I want to thank HLTH for helping to convene this and to say that policy changes need to take place for all of us. Um, the, the many issues that all of you point out are contingent upon access to mental health and addiction services, which as we know, have historically been discriminated against by our country and by payers, by our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, yeah, pretty much every payer out there does not pay for, does not cover, um, imposes much higher, um, treatment um, thresholds for authorization of care, and so on. Uh, it's so crucial that for all of us and the, and the groups that we represent, that we do a much better job, as you said, joining together um, in common cause to break down the discrimination that does um, appear against all of us um, when it comes to those who have these diagnoses. And so if we're going to, as you said, improve telehealth as a means to destigmatize because it, it eliminates that uh, self-discrimination uh, and shame that comes with having one of these illnesses and not wanting to be found out, um, I think that it's important that we do the regulatory changes to ensure that many of the temporary um, regulatory changes made possible by COVID uh, are made permanent. Um, and that's going to take all of us as advocates to really press our legislators, um, both at the state and federal level, to, to put these things into place. Um, uh, Cynthia, would you like to say anything about uh, the need for us to try to implement some of these maybe social emotional learning curriculas in our public education to just uh, complement what you're doing? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, even before COVID, there was an increase in uh, mental health issues among youth. I think we all know that 50% of mental health issues develop in youth by the age of 14. So the younger, the better. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of social emotional learning, and I think that it's integral to, uh, to youth. In general, though, we, we're big advocates for awareness and access to educational resources in the schools themselves. Whether that's an increase in school psychiatrists, uh, we have uh, partnered for a couple of years with the National Council for Behavioral Health on a team version of mental health first aid uh, that teaches a young person to respond and recognize to someone in crisis, or uh, whether that's a mental health or a substance abuse crisis. And uh, we were making tremendous strides. We were in 83 schools, tra trained 9,000 teens, and then COVID came upon us. But that said, um, there, we can already point to life-saving situations by having education uh, in this space in schools, both in social emotional learning and mental health space. So um, anything we can do to help move, move that, um, ball along, we're, we're right there with you. And finally, Amit, I know uh, we are on various committees to make sure we have an agenda for the next Congress and maybe the next president to ensure that we don't miss a beat in terms of the things that we need in uh, our public policy that'll do a better job at meeting the needs of all of the, the issues we've just discussed here. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, I, I think the the need for policy is, is profound and important. And um, this is a moment where there's so much happening in this country, putting a spotlight on the, the really significant uh, need for mental health support and the huge deficiencies in multiple systems that we have that are not providing that support overall, and that, that are particularly failing at providing that support for some of the most at-risk parts of, of our nation, including LGBTQ youth, including youth of color. Uh, and so we need to do something about that. Technology is certainly one way that we can do that. And for all the, when we think about young people, all the negative impacts that technology can have and cyberbullying is real and, and, and technology can clearly be used for harm. But for people who are isolated, and when I think about LGBTQ young people in particular, who might be in parts of the country where uh, there are not many providers, and if they are providers, they are not providers that understand the experiences of LGBTQ young people. They don't have um, uh, affirming care for transgender and non-binary young people. Technology can be the lifeline for them. That's part of the theory behind the work that the Trevor Project does to have actual lifelines um, by phone, text, and chat, and a uh, safe space social networking site we have called Trevor Space, where people can be in virtual community via technology, even if they might be physically isolated. And, and I think as we talk about policy, as we talk about systems and organizations, I do also think it's important that we remember the power that each of us has in individuals picking up on um, Cynthia's really inspiring words and the message around the importance of kindness, kindness and love and support, th they do save lives. And just to quantify that a little bit, uh, at the Trevor Project, we, we did a, a research study and it found that an LGBTQ young person that has just one accepting adult in their lives is 40% less likely to attempt suicide than their peers. And I just want to repeat that because it's such a profound statistic. One, one accepting adult, one person can reduce the risk of suicide of an LGBTQ young person by 40%. So I want to encourage everyone watching and listening to this. You can be that person. You can be the one adult who shows acceptance and love and support, lets people know that they are beautiful the way that they are, that they are deserving of love and respect. And most importantly, you can let them know that they are not alone. And by doing that, you can help save lives. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think you point, I mean, about cultural competence. So not only do we need more access to care, we need access to better care that's accountable. Um, we need to bring more clinicians into this space and more uh, clinicians that look like um, the people that they're serving. And, and that's going to require some major policy changes in the way we educate what our continuing education and what incentives we bring to have people go into this space. So I really appreciate everyone's uh, point. And I just want to say that this, these are not insignificant issues to employers. So the audience of HLTH um, understands that they need to make sure that their clients who are the employers um, these payers need to understand that if they have a um, employee whose family is being impacted by lack of access to care, that's going to put the employee at risk of being offline, either through presenteeism or uh, absenteeism. And so it's going to be crucial as never before that we don't look at these as others, but that we know that when one person is affected, the whole family is affected. So I thank you all for helping to bring this home for those who are viewing. And I know that you've all given them many resources for them to turn to, to get more information. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.